welcome to the official Mountain View Church podcast. For information about our gathering times, location, or how you can connect with us, visit us at mvc.life. So today we're finishing a series that we've been in for the last seven weeks um, in healthy relationships, and uh, it's been a really good thing. I, I've heard a lot of people that have said it's been life changing, um, that the principles that they're learning on Sunday morning and then in their groups and through reading this, this book, uh, Keep Your Love On, you'll notice my, my copy is very worn out because I refer to it constantly. Um, it, it's just really practical, important stuff. And if you haven't got the book, get it. If you haven't been here for the whole series, go online on mvc.life, watch it or listen to it. And then, um, but, but here's the thing. This kind of stuff can only change your life if you practice it, Amen. right? E- everything like that. When you can learn stuff. You can, you can give assent mentally to stuff. But if you really believe something, then you put it into practice in your life. And when you put pr- it into practice in your life, it might be a little awkward at first. A lot of the stuff that we're talking about in this series um, doesn't necessarily come naturally. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to do a series on it. Like we've never done a series on how to mess up your relationships, right? Because that comes naturally. It's easy, right? But, but a series on how to have healthy relationships and not suck as a person is a little bit harder. And so that's why it's going to take practice. It's going to take practice so that you can change your habits over the long haul. Because what got you here, if you keep doing the same thing, is not going to get you to where you want to be unless you're already happy where you're at. Um, If you want your relationships um, to get better and to continue to improve and to be healthy, you have to practice. And and today, we're going to talk about practicing setting and uh, enforcing boundaries. And, you know, boundaries are something that's really important in our own personal lives. I mean, it's, it's something that's in the news as we think about even the borders of our country and in your house and the borders of your house and how do you protect uh, you know, in a, uh, an establishment that you own against, you know, people that are going to come in to try to steal or kill or destroy. Like, there, there's all of those issues. And as Christians, we have this calling to keep our love on toward people and to, um, you know, to be like Jesus. And sometimes it gets really confusing because we want to be like Jesus and lay our lives down for other people, even as these guys said. But sometimes we get confused and and we're like, well, then how do we set boundaries? And when do I say yes? And when do I say no? I think today, and this message today will be so practical for you, especially if you're one of those people that has a hard time saying no to people or you say yes and then you just feel resentful because you you said yes to something that you really wanted to say no to. Um, And and, and it'll be helpful for you to, to understand how to prioritize your life. And your yeses and nos. Um, uh, talk about it this way. This is what a boundary is. I'll just show you a little picture. It's basically just a line or kind of a dotted line between me and everyone and everything else. Pretty easy, right? Elementary. But it's really important because when I don't have a clear boundary between where my responsibility ends and yours begins, I will violate your boundary all the time. I will. I will uh, step into space and take responsibility for things that are yours or expect you to take responsibility for things that are mine. And as we started this series, we talked about that the very beginning of healthy relationships is this idea of self-control, that we have to take responsibility for ourselves. And I have to be responsible for me and trust that you'll be responsible for you. And that really is where boundaries come full circle to, to, to creating a picture of how that works in our day-to-day life. So I want to I wanna show you a little bit of how that works because it really is central to our life of faith. And it's, it's central to this idea of what we call stewardship. And a lot of times when people say stewardship, they mean giving in church, like to give you tithes and offerings and stuff. Steward is a manager and it's somebody that's entrusted with something. You have been entrusted with your whole life and it's not just your money. It's your time, it's your energy, it's what you spend your time doing, it's what you spend your, um, you know, the gifts that you have, the abilities that you have. You've been given that to steward. And you are responsible before God to steward it well. 
When Adam and Eve, you know, in the very beginning of the Bible, you know, God takes these people, he creates a man, creates a woman, puts them in a garden to tend it and keep it. The word is like to, to work it and to care for it or to guard it, like that language. And, and it's basically what God has done with every single one of us. He has given us a garden of our life or a, you know, sphere of influence, something that you have control over. And every one of you has it. In fact, some uh, language that, that maybe helps you understand a little bit what we talk about when we talk about God's kingdom is, is this language of kingdom. And who helped me with this is Dallas Willard. And he, he writes it this way. He says, um, our kingdom is simply the range of our effective will. In other words, it's where what you want done gets done. Your kingdom is where what you say goes. We all have one. He says, our, our kingdom is the range of our effective will. Whatever we genuinely have the say over is in our kingdom. And our having the say over something is precisely what makes it within our kingdom. In creating human beings, God made them to rule, to reign, and to have dominion in a limited sphere, within the sphere of things that they have control over, responsibility over. To have dominion in a limited space, only so can they be persons. And this is why, from a very early age, we even teach our kids to have dominion over their own self, right? You know, uh, stop, don't touch me there. These are my no-no squares, right? You, like, you remember that thing they learn in school? I think they have a song that goes with it. But to have dominion over their own body and to go, I can take responsibility for me and I get to say what happens with me. And it's really important that you teach your kids that. It's really important, not just that, <clears throat> that we teach our children, uh, not just to be dependent on us for everything, but to take responsibility for themselves. And that's why when they get a little older, we give them the responsibility to pick out their own clothes, right? Because they get to make decisions about what happens for them. And that's like, you know, why Luke, my son, used to be dressed as Spider-Man every time, you know, we went anywhere. Because, like, he got to pick out his own clothes, and we're like, cool, all right, you can be Spider-Man. And as you get older, you get responsibility for your room and maybe your kingdom. Some of you may still be at the stage where the extent of your kingdom is your bedroom. And it's the only place that you really have say over what happens. And even then your mom tells you to clean it up, right? But, but here's the thing. It's your kingdom and, and you are responsible for it. And the more you can take responsibility for what is under your authority, See, that's how the kingdom of God expands. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, we see in those early chapters of Genesis that Adam and Eve and every one of us ever since basically have abdicated our responsibility to care for and guard and protect the garden that God's given us. And we let somebody else or something else do it. And that's what idolatry is about. That's what sin's about. When you sin, you give permission for somebody else to make call the shots in your kingdom, in your place. And you give this, this sense of, of permission and agreement because everything works on the basis of agreement. Everything that God does with us and everything in the spiritual world works on the basis of what we agree to. When Adam and Eve agreed to eat the fruit that the enemy told them to eat, the enemy, the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, they agreed with him, they unleashed hell on earth. And it's affected all of our lives ever since. But when we make agreement with God, we can start to turn the tide and turn things in the other direction. That's what the, how the kingdom of God expands. Because when, when we see that Jesus is king and we say yes to Jesus and we bow the knee to Jesus and come under his authority and we bring with us everything that's under our authority, it comes under his authority. Now the kingdom is expanding like mustard seed, like yeast. And person by person and family by family, it, it spreads throughout the earth. And for those of you that, that have just your room as the kingdom, that's a good starting place. Someday you'll have a car and then that'll be in your kingdom. And then you'll have responsibilities and a job and you'll have a family. And, 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 and more and more, the more we can bring whatever we have authority over in our kingdom under the authority of Jesus, the more the kingdom expands. But that's where boundaries come in. Because where the boundaries of your kingdom are is what you have authority over. And getting clear about what you have responsibility for and what you don't is really important. It's important to protect you 
from being overrun by consumers who want to take from you? Because, listen, if you have a garden, if you don't put up a fence, the rabbits or the deer are going to come and eat it, right? You have to guard anything that's, that's valuable in your life. And that's what this idea is of this, this thing called boundaries. And it's important that we respect other people's boundaries and not that we try to f- force our will on other people. See, even Jesus does this, right? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone opens the door, I'll come in and have a relationship with you. He doesn't force his way into relationship with you. And he doesn't want to control your life. I've heard people say this so many times, like, I just want God to be in control. He won't, I promise you. He has given you authority of your life, and he has given you the spirit of, one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. Because God has given you the ability to control yourself so that you can manage your kingdom under the authority of his kingdom willingly. Not by force, not because you have to, not because you're a puppet and you say, oh God, take over my body and you're like somehow possessed and start doing God things, right? No, because you decide that you're gonna use all your resources, all your time, all your money, all of your, who you are to come under his authority and then stuff gets ordered rightly and your relationships function in a healthy way. See, a lot of us have relationships that, that violate each other's boundaries. Um, you know, Danny Silk says in his book this thing about codependency. He says, codependency is driven by the agreement Once again, everything's driven by agreements, but this is the agreement that I will work harder on your problem in your life than you do. And that is not love. How many of you have ever had somebody you've been trying to fix and it hasn't worked yet, right? This is why, because it's not love, that's codependency, because you care more. It's like, I remember this with my kids and especially with Zach and with Rachel, like I, I cared so much more about their grades than they did, so much more. And so I'm always having to harp on them and say stuff. And finally, I realized, like, this isn't working. Like, I just complain about it and harp on it and ask them. And I, all I ever talk to them about is, did you do your homework? Did you do your homework? And it's like, at some point, they have to take responsibility for their life. And they have to choose. Because I can't do it for people. And so we create this weird codependent relationships when we care more about stuff than other people. And when we force our will on other people. Jesus respected people's boundaries, and he had boundaries of his own. You'll remember he respected people's boundaries like he came to a guy that was at this pool of Bethesda, remember, in the city of Jerusalem, and there was that pool where people would, you know, jump in to try to get get healed when, like, an angel would stir the water, and this guy's laying there for 38 years. And Jesus came up to him, and rather than just assuming because he's laying at a pool where you're trying to get healed and he's paralyzed and he's laying on the ground that that guy wanted to get healed, which would be a pretty safe assumption. You think if you're Jesus, you could just go, hey, ha ha, you're better. But Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? He waited to be invited to be given permission because see, that's how it works. Everything works by permission and by agreement. He did the same thing with the blind beggar that comes to him and is obviously blind and begging And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? See, because Jesus had enough respect to have that 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 person has to give their consent. It's why it's so hard to fix people when they don't give you their consent. They don't want to be fixed. Even praying for people is hard. It's so much better if they give their consent to it because then they're in agreement with you and you're in agreement with them, with God. That's what Jesus means when he said, if two of you agree about anything, ask of my father and he'll do it for you. You have to be coming in an agreement. There's, there's power in that agreement. And that's how the kingdom works and it's how it expands. But it's also important for boundaries. Jesus, um, he... Uh, Let's see. Oh, there's this, there's this passage in John where it says this. It says that he didn't entrust himself to them. It's talking about after Jesus, a lot of people were following him as he went to Jerusalem for the Passover. And it says, but he didn't entrust himself to them for he knew all people and he did not need someone's testimony about someone else for he knew it was in their hearts. 
Jesus not only respected other people's boundaries, but he had boundaries of his own, which meant he would love people. I mean, if there's anybody that says Jesus wasn't the most loving guy ever, they haven't really read kind of who he is, right? But Jesus' love and trust are not the same thing. And as we talked about last week, forgiveness and love aren't the same thing. And sometimes you can love someone and not trust them. You need to love them from arm's distance in order to keep your love on and keep yourself safe. And that's how boundary, the, the issue of boundaries. And it's, it's so important. And if you think, well, come on, this is just psycho babble. No, Jesus did it. Listen, Jesus had boundaries. He, he said he had a clear yes and a clear no. When Jesus was, um, was, was working, he said, I'm working, my father's working. I, I only do what I see the father doing. Jesus had this clear yes to his relationship with the father. And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet with God and I'm gonna do what God's doing. He had this clear yes that he was headed to the cross, which is why he wouldn't be dissuaded when people told him other directions. Even when Peter said, come on, Lord, you don't wanna do that. He says, get behind me, Satan. Not because Peter was Satan, but because that message, that idea of diverting Jesus away, he knew was not from God because Jesus had a clear yes. In fact, Jesus is the one that said that when you, uh, instead of swearing and going, oh, swear to God, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. And because Jesus had a very clear yes in his life, he was able to say no to other things. In fact, I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but Jesus saying yes meant that he was saying no to a lot of other things. Like, for instance, all the temptations that the devil came in the wilderness to tempt him to say, you know, why don't you, you know, show off and jump off the temple or why don't you, um, you know, turn this bread into stones. Like, Jesus was clear what his yes was, so he was able to say no to those things. He was clear what his yes was and that he was committed to, to heal people and to teach. But sometimes when he'd get so many people pressing in on him, he'd say to his disciples, let's leave here and go to another town because I've got to preach the gospel there too, because that's why I've come. Like Jesus had this clear yes, that even with the pull of what people wanted him to do, he wouldn't get dissuaded. You see it in, you know, for instance, like in a very specific way with like the story of Jarius. Remember, remember Jarius was this guy that he had a daughter that was sick. It was like 12 year old daughter. And it's in all, three different gospels. Mark chapter five is, is uh, one of them. And he says, um, you know, Jairus comes and, and Jesus had just gotten off the boat after he like healed this demoniac, this guy that was possessed over in the, uh, the, you know, on this other side of the lake. And he comes back and the crowds just swarm around Jesus. And he's been pretty famous by this time. And everybody wants to get healed. Everybody's like coming to him. And they're bringing all kinds of sick people. And Jesus, um, Jairus asks him, will you come heal my daughter? And, and Jesus says, Yes. And so Jesus starts walking and it says that he had to press through the crowd and the crowd was pressing on him so much that that was when that woman, you know, touched his cloak and like got healed. And he's like, well, who touched me? And everybody's like, come on, everybody's touching you. Like who's not touching you, right? And, and he's, he's walking through. But Jesus was saying in his yes to Jairus about going to heal his daughter, Jesus was saying no to all those other people. It wasn't a permanent no, it wasn't like, no, I don't like you. No, I don't care about you. No, God doesn't really love you. No, he, but in order to say yes to Jairus, he had to go somewhere. And so he was saying no to something else because he let his yes be yes and his no be no. Now, that woman did get healed on the way. Jairus' daughter did die when he was on the way, but Jesus still got there and he still healed him. But even the fact of Jesus like coming to earth to live as a Jewish man in the first century, they call it, theologians call it the scandal of particularity. That because like God chose to show up in person at that one time and place, in saying yes to that, he was saying no to everybody else on the earth at the time. To all the people in China, all the people in the United States, or they wasn't the United States, like right, Native Americans or whoever was wherever, See, it wasn't a permanent no because ultimately his plan was that through what he did in that one place, all the nations of the earth could be blessed and God could bless all people. But you could only be in one place at one time. And so say this out loud, I am a limited resource. 
even Jesus, who is like the infinite God made finite and human, was a limited resource. He only had the same amount of hours in the day that you have. He only had the capacity that one human being could have. I mean, a human being as full of God as you could be, who, you know, in his identity is God himself, but he was still a human being. And the reality is we all have a capacity. We all have resources. And out of those resources, we live our lives. And no one except you is responsible for stewarding the resources of your life. You can't put it on somebody else. And this is why you need to get clear about your yeses and your noes and to have a very clear calling from God about what that is. Because if you don't, somebody else will run your life. John Eldridge said it this way in his book, Desire. He said, without a deep and burning desire of our own, we will be ruled by the desires of others. If you aren't clear about what your yeses are, you're gonna say yes to a lot of things. And you're never gonna get done the few things that are most important or the one thing that's the most important. If you aren't clear about who you've already said yes to, you're gonna violate your relationships and break your promises with those people in order to say yes and make other promises to other people that you may not have a relationship with. That's why this is so important that you get clear about your yeses, clear about taking responsibility for your kingdom and that you create boundaries. Because boundaries communicate value. If I were to take my wallet and throw it out in the parking lot and walk away, what would you think about what's in my wallet? Probably not that valuable, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't just throw it in the parking lot. But if I were to take my wallet and take it down to the bank and get a safe deposit box and put it in the safe deposit box, what would you think? you think, what's in his wallet, <laughs> right? Like, wow, what, what's in his wallet that he's got to like keep it locked up in a safe deposit box? Because boundaries... The greater the boundary, the, the more value that we communicate because we put things that are valuable in places that are safe. And if you value your life and if you value the important relationships in your life, you will protect them by putting boundaries about, around them. And those boundaries can communicate your value for those relationships with those people in your life. That's one of the things that boundaries do. It means that you are managing you and your kingdom, and that's where we get self-control. Now, Proverbs tells us that um, a person without self-control is like a city without walls. It's a beautiful picture. I mean, it's not a beautiful picture. It's a good picture to get in your head of what it's like when somebody doesn't have self-control, when they don't take responsibility for what's in their kingdom, they spill over into other people's and they violate other people or they allow people to violate them and then they get angry about it and bitter about it. I'll give you an example. Danny uses this in his book, Danny Silk. He says, so we all know instinctively what boundaries are. Like, like, like imagine this scenario. Imagine there's a guy that drives by your house every day. Everybody's got one of these that you see this neighbor, you don't know their name, you don't know who they are, but you see their car and they drive by all the time. You don't think anything of it. Maybe even wave to that person. One day, that guy pulls up in your driveway, right? And he stops in your driveway, gets out and walks right through your front door. Doesn't knock, just walks right in. And you're like, hey. And he's like, hey, is that the fridge? Yeah. Okay. And gets out, carton of milk, just starts chugging it right out of the carton. You're like, uh, what's going on? He's like, tired. Is that the bedroom back this way? Yeah. He goes in, takes his shoes off, takes his clothes off, gets naked, lays in your bed, okay? How are you feeling right about now, right? Violated. You feel violated because this is not right. This person has no boundaries. They are socially unaware and maybe possibly dangerous, right? Why are they in my house sleeping in my bed? Now, you know instinctively that there are different levels of intimacy within your house. There are some people that you don't invite in, that you leave them on the front doorstep. There are some people that you invite in to come sit at your kitchen table or your dinner table. There are some people 
that you will let use your bathroom. There are fewer people that you will bring into your bedroom and certainly just let them go sleep in your bed naked, right? Because there are different levels of intimacy that communicate different levels of the relationship. And we have boundaries around them to protect them and to define those things. So let me give you an example and show you a picture of a, a city. This is an ancient city. This is Jerusalem. It's actually not Jerusalem. It's a model of Jerusalem uh, that's in Jerusalem. Um, but it's a, it's a picture. Uh, on the right is the exterior wall of the city that actually faces the, the Kidron Valley. And those gates that, that are on that side is, is the gate, uh, the wall right into the, the temple walls. Um, but around that whole temple area, there's this large colonnade, Solomon's Colonnade. It's where the disciples used to meet when they met under the, sometimes they called it Solomon's Porch, um, under those columns. And then that was kind of the court of the Gentiles. And anybody could come there. That was where they did the buying and the selling of the sheep and or, you know, all the animals that Jesus kind of got mad and started flipping over the tables. That was kind of an open, it was almost like a marketplace area. It was this open area. Anybody could come there. But inside of that, but, but even that anybody could come there, not anybody could come there. Because as you see this city, there's walls around it, but there's a gate. And so the idea of a city being protected with walls is that there's a gate that you can let people in that are safe. And if people are coming to steal, kill, and destroy, or you know, take over your city, or a foreign army is invading, you can lock up the walls, you know, get archers on the wall, and protect your city. But just assuming that the people that are coming are you know, friendly and they just want to trade, they want to sell stuff and whatever, you can open the gates, you let them in the city. At night, you close the gates, just like you lock the door of your house. That's a boundary. But people can come into that first area, and that's where can, commerce can happen. But then inside of that, there's these courts, and you, you notice how it gets you know, smaller, smaller spaces until it gets to the middle with that cube, that big cube that's sitting there in the middle. That's the most holy place, the, the holy of holies, it's called, where the Ark of the Covenant was and the presence of God was said to rest in that place. And in that place, in that holiest place, only the priest could go, the high priest, and only once a year during the Day of Atonement. Otherwise, it was just God's space, like we just let God go in there. And then just outside of God's space, that holy of holy space, there's, there's like a court of the priests where the priests go and they offered the regular daily sacrifices and all that kind of stuff in that, that priestly court. But regular people couldn't go there. And then there was that court of the, the men. And if you're a Jewish man, you could go in that court and you could go in that area. And then they had court farther out for the women and farther out for the Gentiles. This was the way that the temple worked in Jerusalem. And it was the values that said, the holiest of things we put um, in the least accessible place. And that's basically how boundaries work to give you a picture of it. Now, here's a picture of it if you were to look at uh, Danny Silk's picture of it. This is from his book. He kind of draws it differently. It's more of concentric circles. And on the outside, far circles, the people that you want to keep outside of your city that you don't want to let in is like Charlie Sheen and Al-Qaeda, right? Now, he wrote this book, obviously, when Charlie Sheen was a big deal, and Al-Qaeda was also a big deal. But, um, but, but the point is, people that don't feel safe, you may want to keep them far from you and not want to be in personal relationship with them, but you can still keep your love on toward them. What we've been talking about in this series about, you know, in this book about keeping your love on, we can turn on our love and keep it on regardless of what the people do. You can love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You don't have to let them in your house, but you can pray for them from a distance. We are called to love everybody that way. And we can do that and keep ourselves safe at the, at the same time. This is what's really important to understand about boundaries and Christians get this confused a lot. They think, oh, if I'm gonna love people, it means I've gotta let them all into my life. And then if they keep abusing me or hurting me or doing things to me, like I just keep forgiving them and that means I gotta keep trusting them and letting them back in, that's not how it works. And we talked last week about that. If you think that or you struggle with that, go back and listen to that message about forgiveness. Because forgiveness and trust aren't the same thing. You can forgive someone and prosecute them to the full extent of the law if that's what needs to happen. 
to protect other people from being abused by that same abuser. Listen, if you're being abused, you could say something. In fact, say something to somebody here because we want to help. We don't want anybody to just sit here in silence and just pretend that's okay. Abuse is not okay. And we want to protect marriages. We, we, we want to try to save people from divorce. But listen, if, if you're being abused, it, 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 it needs to stop. And the boundary is not telling other people what they can and can't do. It's just saying what you will do and what you will not do. Remember when we talked about this? I will continue this conversation if we can do it respectfully. I will come back when you stop drinking or I will, you know, have a relationship with you when you have gotten some help and made some changes. What, whatever those, those boundaries, no one can set boundaries for you except you. And we can't set them for other people and either to offend or to please other people. We have to set them based on what is our yes and what is our no. And this picture gives us a good picture of that and how to order our life. Because in the center, like the holy of holies in the temple, in the center is the very presence of God. And God alone can live in that center point. When the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, it means that God doesn't need temples made out of blocks and bricks anymore. He's come to live inside people. And in the core of your being, in your heart, at the core of where you are, that's where God wants to live. And when you say yes to Jesus and you bring your life under his kingdom and you say yes to the Holy Spirit, he comes into your life and takes up residence there. And that is your most important, closest relationship. And it has to be. If you let anybody else into that God spot, you put anybody else in that, that primary place in your life where like you would die without them or I just couldn't live without you or you live for another person, you are going to ruin that relationship and that relationship is going to ruin you. Amen. You can't do it with a, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife. You can't do it with your kids. Amen. And some of you moms struggle with that because you love your kids and you put them at the center of your life, but only God can be at that center part. Otherwise, you create idols, right? That's idolatry. When you put something else in the place of God. But outside of that place, there's room for maybe one, for one person, really. One closest relationship. And it may be when you're growing up, it's a best friend, a brother, a sister. It might be your mom, your dad. When you get married, it becomes your spouse. And it has to be your spouse. If your spouse isn't in that position, your relationship and your marriage is gonna suck, right? It's gonna be a mess. Some of you, still have your mom in that position. And you're bringing that into a marriage. And the reason the Bible said that you must leave, that a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they become one flesh is because there's room for one position and you have to leave the one before you can do the other one. And so those of you that are thinking about, you know, or go entering into marriage, like you have to be able to move your mom out to a further circle. Doesn't mean you don't love your mom. It just means you're not, she's not in your bedroom. <laughs> in your bed. Got it? Right? There, there's a different level of intimacy that you have. Now, some of you that have been married and had kids and gotten divorced, this is a big issue. And this is really because I, I do, I meet a lot of couples that want to get married and they, they've got kids and they're like, but my kids always come first. I'm like, listen, you just need to know that if you're getting married, now your kids come first right now. But if you choose to get married, you're changing that. Your kids can be in that inner circle when you don't have anybody else. But if you get married and you don't move your kids outside to a farther out place, your marriage isn't going to work. And it's not going to work for your kids either because it creates unhealthy attachments in ways that really should be with your spouse. And so ordering these things is really important. God needs to be at the center. We have room for one relationship. That's the closest. And then we have room for our kids and our grandkids. And, and then as you go out farther and farther, you can add more and more people to your circle. You may have lots of acquaintances, some friends, a few best friends, people that are your family, the closest people to you. And, and here's why this is so important. 
Because when you say yes to a relationship, you're saying no to other things. When I said yes to marrying my wife, that meant that I'm not gonna marry any other women or date any other women, right? That means I got one wife, that's it. The rest of the women are my sisters and my mothers and my daughters. That's it. I got one wife. To say yes means I'm saying no. When I say yes to having kids, it means that the rest of my life is not my own. Like a big chunk of my life and my attention and my money and my time is given over already. It's committed. So that means I got to say no to other things. Every yes you say is a no to something else. Until you recognize that, you're going to violate your boundaries all over the place. Now, and, and, and people are going to come and, and they're going to consume what may not be theirs to consume. Like what I mentioned earlier with a, a garden and bunnies or deer, right? Bunnies and deer are not evil, right? They're cute. They're certainly not evil. They're just hungry. And there are people in your life that are not evil, but they will take everything you will give them. Amen. They're not evil. They're just hungry. But you have to decide where you're going to, how you're going to steward what you have. And that's what boundaries do, is they help clarify what you've already said yes to so that you can say no to other things. And so that you can say yes to other things when you want to. Like Danny Silk says it this way in his book, in Keep Your Love On, he says, the beautiful thing is that when you have a necessary boundary in place, you don't need to treat consumers like the enemy. If your garden has a fence, you can choose to throw some fruit over uh, for a deer or offer a carrot to a bunny by your choice, not by letting them come in and just take it. When you have healthy boundaries, you stay in control of the resources of your life and you manage them toward your priorities. This is so crucial because otherwise what happens is people come into your life and they take what they need and you get resentful and you get bitter and then you try to keep a safe distance rather than create a safe connection because you're like just trying to protect yourself from them. But if you're clear about what you're committed to, it's much easier later. I don't know about you, but like I, it's hard for me to say no to people. Like when somebody wants something from me, like that's why Jesus, I think he says, whoever asks receives and he who seeks finds, whoever knocks the door. I think it's just like, normally that's how it works. Like you ask, you get stuff. And some people just really get good at asking all the time for everything or that taking, and, and, and then what happens is we get resentful and we say yes when we mean no and then we blame the person that asked rather than recognizing it was our responsibility. We have to take responsibility for our own life, for saying what we will do, for saying what we will not do. Otherwise, we create all kinds of havoc. Now, um, I learned this. Fortunately, I, I learned it early in my life as a, as a dad and as a husband, but I've had to struggle with it, honestly, all my life because being in ministry, um, I want to help everybody and I want to be available to people. And especially when I was young, I was a youth pastor and I wanted to just be there for everybody. And just like, it's just a great thing when you help somebody or you're speaking to their life or you're there for them in a difficult time and it really means something to them. And then you just... I, I, for me, I just felt like I wanted more and more of that. And, and in that idealism of going, I just want to be like Jesus. I want to lay down my life for people. I want to just pour out my life in service. I was doing that. And I, I went to a, a seminar or a training. It was called the Momentous Training. Uh, when I was, Zach was like a year old. And one of the things that they did in the seminar is they had this, this kind of like, exercise where we had kind of some, we did exercises and then debriefed and talked about them. And, and one of them had to do with this idea of, a, um, of like we were on a cruise ship and, and it was kind of this story where you just kind of imagine we're on a cruise ship, we're having these great connections, these great, you know, discussions over meals, we're getting clear about what God's doing in our life and, and uh, we're just building great relationships and man, we love these people and, and, um, and you're just getting clear and then boom, like the ship goes down, like there's a, a, a you know, we hit an iceberg and it's basically the Titanic um, this is before the Titanic movie came out. Otherwise, that's exactly what's in my mind when I think about it. And, and, and the, the, the thing was, okay, there's one lifeboat and there's like, you know, 
X number of spots. You got to get up and you have 30 seconds to declare your intention about the lifeboat. And I, you know, being the great person that I am, got up and said, I'll give my place on the lifeboat because I've lived a good life and I love Jesus and I know him and I know where I'll be and so someone else can have my spot. Now, there was no guarantee that anybody had a spot. It was just saying what your intention was, right? And so I, you know, go sit back down. Everybody else kind of says their thing. Um, and, and then, you know, basically I'm laying there drowning in the water and I realized all of a sudden it hit me like my son, who's only a year old, is going to grow up without a dad. I'm the only dad this kid has. And for the sake of trying to appear to be really generous and nice and holy, I sacrifice my life for Charlie Sheen <laughs> and let my son grow up without a father and my wife without a husband. And I realized the falseness, the seductive... Uh, arrogance and self-importance that was running my life, that I have to be there for everybody. Their life's going to fall apart without me. I'm the one who can say, Jesus is already the Savior of the world. He, you're not the Savior. And he has given you responsibility and opportunity to have an incredible impact in people's lives. But the greater the impact you will have in people's lives is those people in that inner circle and the next circle. And if you sacrifice those people for the sake of the people out on the fringes, then you've just wasted your life. And you've just ruined the lives of other people and you haven't been a faithful steward with what God's given you. And I realized that that day and it's like, it, it was a good thing because I wouldn't have survived this long in ministry without realizing that and learning how to set boundaries to say, like, I love everybody, but I don't love everybody the same. You can't love everybody the same and you can't give everybody equal access to you. Because if I've already said, when I signed up to marry my wife, I said yes to her. When I signed up to have kids, I said yes to them. I have people in my life that I have yeses to that when I, you know, like, like when, I, when I tell my wife I'm gonna be home for dinner and then somebody goes, hey, I need help. Can you help me with this? And, and I go, oh, I wanna help them and I don't wanna say no, but I've already made a commitment. And then if I say, well, I'm gonna go home for dinner, like that doesn't sound very spiritual. And so... Like, what do you do? Well, realize that you already said a yes that might mean another no. And you need to get over being liked and caring as much what people think of you and get starting to care about taking responsibility for your life and for being faithful to your promises and to being faithful to the relationships you've said yes to and not keep violating those things based on your circumstances or the needs of the moment or how you feel at any given time. This is why this is so important that we order our lives according to these most important relationships. And this will help you. There's two chapters in this book about it and then the last chapter too. If you haven't got it yet, you should read it. But I'm gonna go ahead and read something with you as a conclusion to this series. Um, I know some of you are still meeting in groups and talking about these things, but as the band comes back up to close us out, I just wanna read this declaration over your relationships because, you know, we get to declare what we're going to do. We don't get to tell other people what to do. And these declarations are a way of saying, this is where I stand. And what I'd love to do is to have you stand up with me and let's say them together if you mean them. If you don't, after hearing it, don't say it. But still stand up either way. If you can, if you're able. Um, and we'll say these together. And, and again... Say it if you mean it, and then if you get the book, it's on page 160. You can go back and read them. Yeah. So you can repeat after me. I know the spirit of power and love are at work in me. I can love at all times through Christ who strengthens me. I am courageous with my love. I am powerful to control myself no matter what others choose to believe or do. 
My goal is connection, not distance. I will tell others about me and let them tell me about them. I matter and so do you. I clearly and honestly express what I'm feeling and what I need to feel. Some of you slacked off on that one. (laughs) I communicate my value and priorities by expecting respect. I show respect by listening well and honoring the boundaries of others. I keep my love on and chase fear out of my most vital relationships. Amen, God, may it be so.